Hello friends, how are you all? Welcome to my channel. I am Nopur. I am continuing the story, The Big Wave by Paul S. Park. And in the last uh, second one, uh, we found that Gia and Kino, they were very much afraid because there was a big hurricane coming from the sea and the volcano also has just woken from their sleep and it's a terrible situation but we have to know that what happened to Gia's family. I'm sure that you are also very much interested to know the rest of the story like me. So let's come and share together. The wave ran up the mountain side until the knoll where the castle stood was an island. All who were still climbing the path were swept away, black, tossing scraps in the wicked waters. The wave ran up the mountain until Kino and Gia saw the wave curl up at the terrace walls upon which they stood. Then with a great sucking sigh, the wave swept back again ebbing into the ocean, dragging everything with it, trees and stones and houses. They stood, the man and the two boys, utterly silent, clinging together, facing the wave as it went away. It swept back over the village and returned slowly again to the ocean, subsiding, sinking into a great stillness. Upon the beach where the village stood, not a house remained. No wreckage of wood or fallen stone wall. No little street of shops, no docks, not a single boat. The beach was as clean of houses as if no human beings had ever lived there. All that had been was now no more. Gia gave a wild cry and Kino felt him slip to the ground. He was unconscious. What he had seen was too much for him. What he knew he could not bear. His family and his home were gone. Kino began to cry and Kino's father did not stop him. He stooped and gathered Gia into his arms and carried him into the house. And Kino's mother ran out of the kitchen and put down a mattress and Kino's father laid Gia upon it. It is better that he is unconscious, he said gently. Let him remain so until his own will wakes him. I will sit by him. I will rub his hands and feet, Kino's mother said sadly. Kino could say nothing. He was still crying and his father let him cry for a while. Then he said to his wife, heat a little rice soup for Kino and put some ginger in it. He feels cold. Now Kino did not know until his father spoke that he did feel cold. He was shivering and he could not stop crying. Setsu came in. She had not seen the big wave for her mother had closed the windows and drawn the curtains against the sea. But now she saw Jia lying white, pale and still. Is Jia dead? she asked. No, Jia is leaving, her father replied. Why doesn't he open his eyes? She asked again. Soon he will open his eyes, the father replied. If Jia is not dead, why does Quino cry? Setsu asked. You are asking too many questions, her father told her. Go back to the kitchen and help your mother. So Setsu went back again, sucking her forefinger and staring at Jia and Kino as she went and soon the mother came in with the hot rice soup and Kino drank it. He felt warm now and he could stop crying, but he was still frightened and sad. What will you say to Jia when he wakes? He asked his father. We will not talk, his father replied. We will give him warm food and let him rest. We will help him to feel he still has a home. Here? Kino asked. Yes, his father replied. I have always wanted another son, and Jia will be that son. As soon as he knows that this is his house, this is his family, then we must help him to understand what has happened. 
So they waited for Jia to wake. I don't think Jia can ever be happy again, Kino said sorrowfully. Yes, he will be happy someday, his father said, for life is always stronger than death. Jia will feel when he wakes that he can never be happy again. He will cry and cry and we must let him cry. But he cannot always cry. After a few days, he will stop crying all the time. He will cry only part of the time. He will sit sad and quiet. We must allow him to be sad and we must not make him speak. But we will do our work and live as always we do. Then one day he will be hungry and he will eat something that our mother cooks, something special, and he will begin to feel better. He will not cry any more in the daytime, but only at night. We must let him cry at night, but all the time his body will be renewing itself, his blood flowing in his veins, his growing bones, his mind beginning to think again will make him live. He cannot forget his father and mother and his brother, Kino exclaimed. He cannot, and he should not forget them, Kino's father said. Just as he lived with them alive, he will live with them dead. Someday he will accept their death as part of his life. He will weep no more. He will carry them in his memory and his thoughts. His flesh and blood are part of them. So long as he is alive, they too will live in him. The big wave came, but it went away. The sun shines again, birds sing, and earth flows. Look out over the sea now. Kino looked out the open door, and he saw the ocean sparkling and smooth. The sky was blue again. A few clouds on the horizon were the only sign of what had passed, except for the empty beach. How cruel it seems for the sky to be so clear and the ocean so calm, Kino said. But his father shook his head. No, it is wonderful that after the storm the ocean grows calm and the sky in blue once more. It was not the ocean or the sky that made the evil storm. Who made it? Kino asked. He let tears roll down his cheeks because there was so much he could not understand. But only his father saw them and his father understood. Ah, no one knows who makes evil storms, his father replied. We only know that they come. When they come, we must live through them as bravely as we can. And after they are gone, we must feed again. How wonderful is life. Every day, every day of life is more valuable now than it was before the storm. But Gia's family, his father and mother and brother and all the other good fisher folk who are lost, Kino whispered. She could not forget the dead. Now we must think of Jia, his father reminded him. He will open his eye at any minute and we must be there, you to be his brother and I to be his father. Call your mother too and little Setsu. Now they heard something. Jia's eyes were still closed but he was sobbing in his sleep. Kino ran to fetch his mother and Setsu and they gathered about his bed, kneeling on the floor so as to be near Jia when he opened his eyes. In a few minutes, while they all watched, Jia's eye lids fluttered on his pale cheeks and then he opened his eyes. He did not know where he was. He looked from one face to the other as though they were strangers. Then he looked up into the beams of the ceiling and around the white walls of the room. He looked at the blue flowered quilt that covered him. None of them said anything. They continued to kneel about him, waiting. But Setsu could not keep quiet. She clapped her hands and laughed. Oh, Jia has come back, she said. Jia, did you have a good dream? The sound of her voice made him fully awake. My father, my mother, he whispered. Kino's mother took his hand. I will be your mother now, dear Jia, she said. I will be your father, Kino's father said. I am your brother now, Jia, Kino faltered. Oh, Jia will live with us, said Su said joyfully. Then Jia understood. He got up from the bed 
and walked to the door that stood open to the sky and the sea. He looked down the hillside to the beach where the fishing village had stood. There was only beach, and all that remained of the twenty and more houses were a few foundation posts and some big stones. The gentle little waves of the ocean were playfully carrying the light timber that had made the house and throwing it on the sands and snatching it away again. The family had followed Jia and now they stood about him. Kino did not know what to say, for his heart ached for his friend brother. Kino's mother was wiping her eyes and even little Setsu looked sad. She took Jia's hand and stroked it. Jia, I will give you my pet duck, she said. But Jia couldn't speak. He kept on looking at the ocean. Jia, your rice broth is growing cold, Kino's father said. We ought all to eat something, Kino's mother said. I have a fine chicken for dinner. I'm hungry, said Sue cried. Come, my son, Kino's father said to Jia. They persuaded him gently, gathering around him, and they entered the house again. In the pleasant, cozy room, they all sat down about the table. Jia sat with others. He was awake. He could hear the voice of Kino's family, and he knew that Kino sat beside him. But inside, he still felt asleep. He was very tired, so tired that he did not want to speak. He knew that he would never see his father and mother anymore, or his brother, or the neighbors and friends of the village. He tried not to think about them, or to imagine their quiet bodies floating under the swelling waves. Eat, Jia, Kino whispered. The chicken is good. Jia's bowl was before him, untouched. He was not hungry, but when Kino begged him, he took up his porcelain spoon and drank a little of the soup. It was hot and good, and he smelled its fragrance in his nostrils. He drank more, and then he took up his chopsticks and ate some of the meat and rice. His mind was still unable to think, but his body was young and strong and glad of the food. When they had all finished, Kino said, Shall we go up the hillside, Jia? But Jia shook his head. I want to go to sleep again, he said. Kino's father understood. Sleep is good for you, he said, and he led Jia to his bed, and when Jia had laid himself down, he covered him with the quilt and shut the sliding panels. Jia is not ready yet to leave, he told Kino. We must wait. The body began to heal first, and Kino's father, watching Jia, tenderly knew that the body would heal the mind and the soul. Life is stronger than death, he told Kino again and again. But each day, Jia was still tired. He did not want to think or to remember. He only wanted to sleep. He woke to eat and then to sleep. And when Kino's mother saw this, she led him to the bedroom. And Jia sank each time into the soft mattress spread on the floor in the quiet, clean room. He fell asleep almost at once. And Kino's mother covered him and went away. All through these days, Kino did not feel like playing. He worked hard beside his father in the fields. They did not talk much, and neither of them wanted to look at the sea. It was enough to look at the earth, dark and rich beneath their feet. One evening, Kino climbed the hill behind the farm and looked toward the volcano. The heavy cloud of smoke had long ago gone away, and the sky was always clear now. He felt happier to know that the volcano was no longer angry, and he went down again to the house. On the threshold, his father was smoking his usual evening pipe. In the house, his mother was giving Setsu her evening bath. Is Jia asleep already? Kino asked his father. Yes, and it is a good thing for him, his father replied. Sleep will strengthen him, and when he wakes, he will be able to think and remember. But should he remember such sorrow? Kino asked. Yes, his father replied. 
Only when he dares to remember his parents will he, he be happy again. They sat together, father and son, and Kino asked still another question. Father, are we not very unfortunate people to live in Japan? Why do you think so? His father asked in reply. Because the volcano is behind our house and the ocean is in front and when they work together for evil to make the earthquake and the big wave, then we are helpless. Always many of us are lost. To live in the midst of danger is to know how good life is, his father replied. But if we are lost in the danger, Kino asked anxiously, to live in the presence of death makes us brave and strong, Kino's father replied. That is why our people never fear death. We see it too often and we do not fear it. To die a little later or a little sooner does not matter. But to live bravely, to love life, to see how beautiful the trees are and the mountains, yes, and even the sea to enjoy work because it produces food for life. In these things, we Japanese are a fortunate people. We love life because we live in danger. We do not fear death because we understand that life and death are necessary to each other. What is death? Kino asked. Death is the great gateway, Kino's father said. His face was not at all sad. Instead, it was quiet and happy. The gateway, where? Kino asked again. Kino's father smiled. Can you remember when you were born? Kino shook his head. I was too small. Kino's father laughed. I remember very well. Oh, how hard you thought it was to be born. You cried and you screamed. Didn't I want to be born? Kino asked. This was very interesting to him. You did not, his father told him smiling. You wanted to stay just where you were in the warm, dark house of the unborn. But the time came to be born and the gate of life opened. Did I know it was the gate of life? Kino asked. You did not know anything about it and so you were afraid of it, his father replied. But see how foolish you were. Here we were waiting for you, your parents already loving you and eager to welcome you and you have been very happy, haven't you? Until the big wave came, Kino replied. Now I am afraid again because of the death that the big wave brought. You are only afraid because you don't know anything about death, his father replied. But someday you will wonder why you were afraid, even as today you wonder why you feared to be born. While they were talking, the dusk had deepened and now coming up the mountainside they saw a flickering light.